Mother's womb. 
you amongst us today and celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our eyes so that we may see your eternal wisdom. Open our ears. Good call. Yep. 
Um, so, you know what's funny is Samuel lived in the church, and he actually um, spent a lot of time with this guy named Eli. Eli was kind of his like mentor. And one day, Samuel heard someone say, um, so he called his name. It's like, Samuel, Ivy, Elliot, oh, good job. He's like, yeah, yeah. Alex, bring that Alex. <laughs> okay. I love it. Stephen, you guessed it. And, and Samuel ended up finding out that it was the Lord saying his name. And the Lord wanted him to continue doing things for the church and, and for God. And so everybody has their bricks. Can I see your Lego bricks? Can you hold them up really high? Hold them up really high. Everybody, Alex, you still have your fingers. There you go. We hold them up. Oh, thank you so much. So when we do things, let's say that we want to build, build something with these bricks. Now everybody only has two bricks. Go ahead and try to build something. What can you build? Uh-huh, yep, we can build. There you go, he's right. got his little tower going. Got little tower, little tower, uh-huh. Little tower, little tower, you yeah, got very true. So when we try to do things by ourselves, we can do some stuff. You can do little things. But let's say everybody, what if we put all of our bricks, like right here, and we build, build something with all of our bricks? Can we do that? Can everybody put their bricks together? Yes. Oh, wow. Alex, can you put your bricks on there too? Miss Mina's going to help us build because we need helpers. Good. Oh, that's looking so good. Absolutely, Elliot. Let's, let's have you. Can you put that red brick on there? Can you put it on there? Good. And Alex, you too? Alex, can you put your bricks on there? We might need some help. We're pretty good at building, but. And sometimes it takes some time. I feel like we should have some elevator music going or something. <laughs> good. <coughs> this is a good lesson. It does take time to build something, right? So that's fair. But, all done, almost done. Good. Okay, everybody stand back and let's see what we made. Can we show everybody what we made? Look at that. Ooh. Oh, okay. good job, everybody. Oh, that was going to help us. Very good. So that just goes to show. <laughs> when we build something together, we can build more. And so we all work together. Good job. Okay, I think we, we nailed this point. Let us know. Everybody have a seat. Let's pray. We're going to take those bricks back to the, the daycare. Can we pray really quick? Do you want to say something before we pray? Christmas is all about people. Oh, thank you so much. Christmas is about that. Yeah. Okay, let's pray. Can we pray real quick? You want to say something? One more thing. Go ahead. And Christmas is also about being with family and celebrating the things that are past. That's very good. I like that we're still talking about Christmas. Because we should just keep on thinking about Christmas all year long, so that's fair. Okay, let's pray really quick, guys. Alright, dear God, thank you so much for today. And thank you that we can all work together to make really cool and beautiful things. In Jesus' name we pray.
here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel, got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for you, your servant, is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Our second lesson is from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6, 13 through 18. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You have me in, behind, and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O oh God! How vast is the sum of them! I tried to count them, they are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Here ends the lesson. Just can't give up. 
words to Colossians also calls us to a deeper understanding of discipleship. In Colossians, the second chapters, verses 6 and 7, uh, it says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built in him, and established in the faith as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. That's Colossians, the second chapter, verses 6 and 7. Whoever says, I abide in him, ought to walk just as he walked. That's First John 2 and 6. Now, this is a dynamic process of growth, grounded in Christ and manifesting in our actions and in our thanksgiving. C.S. Lewis, you might know Narnia, uh, a, liter a literary giant and late theologian, renowned for his works such as Mere Christianity and the Screwtape Letters, bring a unique blend of intellectual rigor and imaginative storytelling to Christian thought. In Mere Christianity, Lewis explores the core of Christian ethics and theology emphasizing the transformative power of faith in the life of a believer. His understanding of discipleship centers on the surrender of the heart to God's authority, a theme that resonates deeply in his writings. The insight of C.S. Lewis reflects on the interdimension of discipleship, and Lewis emphasizes the importance of the heart in our journey with Christ, that it requires a recognition, acceptance, and surrender to God's absolute authority in every aspect of our lives. Jesus' words in, in, the, the, in Luke articulate the weight, the gravitas of this discipleship. It requires surrender, Scripture says in Luke 14 and 33, a daily choice to deny oneself and a commitment to follow in his steps. Luke says, whoever does not give up all their possessions cannot be my disciple. It's a heavy thought. That's in Luke, the 14th chapter, 33rd verse. Luke 9, 23 also says, and he said to them all, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Christopher Mitchell, a esteemed theologian and a scholar on C.S. Lewis, elaborates on Lewis's views in his article, C.S. Lewis, on authentic discipleship. Mitchell interprets Lewis's teachings as a journey of inner, inner transformation and active obedience, encapsulating the dual nature of discipleship as both a matter of the heart and a call to live out Christ's teachings. Secondly, Dallas Albert Willard, an American philosopher known for his teachings on Christian spiritual formation, offers perspective to enrich our understanding and highlights that discipleship calls, involves imitating Christ's life, values, and teachings. He writes this in the Spirit of Disciplines. Discipleship being more than just the transfer of information. It refers to imitating the teacher's life, inculcating his values, and reproducing his teachings. His words, <coughs> Willard's words, like the spirit of the dis disciplines and the renovations of the heart, emphasizes the importance of an inter internal spiritual growth and its outward manifestation in discipleship. Willard argues for discipleship that involves intimidate, in, in, excuse me, Willard argues for a discipleship that involves imitating Christ's life and teaching, integrating this into every aspect in our daily living. But how do we live out this invitation? You know, we have those, those bad, what would Jesus do? How do we live that out in this world? And what does transformation demand from us? As we reflect on being faithful to the call of discipleship, we are reminded that this journey is both internal and external, and it requires a heart transformed by faith, as Lewis teaches, and a life lived in imitation of Christ, as Willard guides us. In this, we find the full expression of discipleship. 
It is a life dedicated to following Jesus in heart, mind, and action. Merging these insights, we can see discipleship as a journey of the heart and action, an ongoing process involving growth, surrender, imitation, and active obedience. So we ponder this path. Are we living out our call in our daily lives? How do we balance faith and skepticism, just as the family did? How are we embodying Christ's love and teachings in our actions? How are we calling and saying, who's calling my name? And when I'm going to Eli, one of the preachers, and they say, I'm not talking to you. How do we find the voice of God in the times in which we need to hear God? In the times of our skepticism, while we are sitting under the tree wondering if there's anything good that can come out of this bad situation, how do we know to hold to our obedience and our call to discipleship? How are we to remain faithful to this call in today's climate? With all of the calamity and all of the things going around, the, the COVID virus is, is as big as it was with Omicron. Came out. We got war, we got rumors of wars, we got people dying, we got earthquakes, and we got all of this calamity in the world. How do we hold on to the faith that called us in the beginning? We hold on to it because we hold on to the call. We hold on to the message that Jesus said, I saw you before I called you. I saw you before I called Philip. You were under the tree waiting on something, but you still believed that when you heard it, you would know what it was. And in spite of your skepticism, you said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I don't know if you know, but Nazareth was considered the ghetto of that time. <laughs> it was considered very poor, you know, those low intellectuals, those working class. Can anything good come out of that? This is a theocracy, so everybody's in church. Everybody knows God. So how can something from something so common, something so simple, be so life-changing? It is because it sounds like the call that you first had. The call before I spoke to you. The call before your friend spoke to you. The call that had you sitting under the tree waiting on the voice. So as we continue to remain faithful to this call, not the times, not what's happening in our lives, our families, in our pockets, in our money, in our investments, in our homes. Not those things, but the things that call you to get up from under the tree in the beginning of the time and walk to see where this man from Nazareth came and said, can anything good come from you? And said, yes, I know that things can come from you, but better things is even going to come from you today because you're going to see greater things than this. And as we also Hold on to the call. Hold on to the one that began the good work. We draw wisdom from the scripture and the insights from these Christian thinkers. We remind ourselves that the author and finisher of our faith has called us into discipleship. And seeing that we're under the tree, contemplating is anything is of worth in this world. We can listen with skepticism in faith, moving and giving on. May it be so for us. Amen. Let us pray. While on others you are calling, do not pass us by. Eternal source, our kinsman redeemer, our lover, Thank you for today. We thank you for your people. We thank you for Salem. We thank you for every person that's connected to us, to the sound of our voice, whether by being online or in person or watching and reading this in the future. We thank you that you have not forsaken us. We thank you that you are even here with us, even now in this presence. For you said in Scripture, we're too touching and agree, you will be there. So we thank you that you're here. We thank you for the imminence that resides on the inside of us, the God that walks with us, the God that dreams with us, that sleeps with us, that eats with us. We thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. 
We thank you that you hear us in our prayers, you hear us in our cries, you hear us in our uh, uh, explanations, you hear us in our excitement, you hear everything about us. You hear our doubts and our fears and our hopes and our prayers, our faith and our realism. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So God, we are standing here today on this cold day, and we're asking you once again to prove yourself to us. We're asking you once again to remind us of the yes that we started this work. Remind us of the impetus that calls us to stand up and to ask again, can anything good come from this place? God, remind us of who you are. Again, remind us of our testimonies. Remind us of the times past that you have shown up and shown out. Remind us of the times that we thought it was over and yet it was just beginning. Remind us of the time where death was actually renewal. Remind us of the time where pain actually became promise. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, as we are here, God, even our unbelief, help us in our unbelief, help us in our fear, help us in our pain, help us in our, our realization, help us in our resignation. Help us when we don't think there's a way out. Help us remain true when the doctor's diagnosis is dying, when the loved one or friend is passing away, when there's no answers in sight. Yes, God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we're standing true on your promises, God. Your yes and amen. We're standing true on the one that began a good one. We're standing true on the miracle that brought you to us and brought us to each other. We're standing true on the promise that is the foundation of the church. That is your love and your peace and your kindness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And while in others you are calling, while in others you're helping, as you're going and moving, as you're touching and healing, as you're holding space and staying alongside as you're praying and laying in the bed in the hospital room or you, as you're walking with the ones with anxiety as you're, as you're giving hope to the ones that are hopeless God, we ask that you touch and agree with us and that you go with our prayers, all the prayers that we're saying, silent prayers and prayers within our hearts and prayers that are laying on our pillows and prayers that are whispered as we go God, because we know that you hear you answered our prayer. So we hold space and silence in this moment and remind you of who you are. We now join together and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his friends and followers. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Love mercy and walk humbly with our God. 